Welcome back, VDiscovery viewers. Today, we're talking more about hashing. We read your comments, you want to know more. So today, we have Danny Barak, Director of Forensics Technology, who's going to explain to us more about hashing. He is right there by the whiteboard, ready to go. So let me stop talking and turn it over to him. Take it away, Danny. Okay, so today I wanna to talk about hashing. Uh, we're gonna go a little bit deeper dive than the usual, uh, based on some conversations that I've had with some of our clients. Now, people tend to get a little bit confused about the different types of hashing, so I wanna go over a little bit of the general and then uh, we'll dive in a little bit deeper. So I've written some really long numbers here on the whiteboard, and the first number that I have up here is an MD5 hash. The second one is a different MD5 hash, and you can see that they're always gonna be 32 characters in length. So two different hashes, same number of characters, but completely different characters. Now you would think that when you put something through a hash algorithm, that if you made a minor change to it, you would end up with just a minor change to the output. But for example here, this is my name. Okay. And this is my name with a lowercase b. So you can see that the entire thing changes when I just change one letter and just by making it lowercase the entire hash changes. So it's not just a minor variation. So what this allows us to do is get these slight differences to reflect in a very large way when it comes to creating a unique identifier for it. Now a hash is not an encryption. A lot of people confuse hashing with encryption. A hash is a digest. It's one way. So you can't decrypt what you've hashed back into the original. You could put an entire hard drive of data, terabytes of data, through the hashing algorithm, and you'll still get something that's only 32 characters in length. Now the characters that are used in hash, you might notice that there's some letters and numbers in there. It's not all the letters in the alphabet. What we're using is something called hexadecimal. And why do we use hexadecimal when we do this? It gives us some more options in terms of the length. Um, and it's also how computers tend to translate binary data a little bit more uh, easily for us to read. When we deal with a decimal system, we're actually dealing with 0 through 9. So we, all, we have all the numbers from 0 through 9. Hexadecimal, you think of like a hexagon as six sides, we're adding an additional six characters to it, A through F. So now we have 0 through 9 and A through F, we have much larger uh, library of numbers we can work from, and that's why these numbers can be so much more unique than just a series of combinations of numbers with a fixed length of 32. Now, um, a lot of people that I've spoken to have asked, why are we still using MD5 hash? And the concern is that they've heard in the news or they've heard on, read on security blogs that MD5 hash is no longer a hash that should be used. Same thing has been said about SHA-1 hash, and most people in the security world are saying you should be at least at SHA-256. Now, that can be confusing in the discovery world because you hear those things and you say, okay, why are you still using MD5? I wanna be on the newer thing. The reason that you don't have to move to that level is because the collision rate in MD5 hash is sufficient for the purposes of deduplication in e-discovery, whereas it may not be sufficient to actually secure a site uh, so the number that I've written down here, this huge, huge number, this is a, um, a, a undecillion, I believe it's called. So 340 undecillion, it's like too many numbers to even read out the entire thing. This is the number of possible combinations that you can get out of an MD5 hash. So you, like an MD5 hash would be one in this number are the chances of you actually having a collision. So that's a huge number. It's larger than a fingerprint. It's larger than the known number of stars in our galaxy. So this is a huge, huge number. Um, when you get into things like the birthday paradox, well, which we may discuss in another video, it's not exactly a one in 340 in decillion, but it's a really, really large number. And it's very unlikely that you're gonna end up with two separate documents that actually hit on this exact same number. But why are people in security having a problem with MD5 and SHA-1. Well, the reason for that is if we're gonna compare two files together and we're gonna run this through our MD5 hash algorithm, this is gonna give us out 
an MD5 hash number, and if they're equal, great, they're duplicates. If they're not equal, then they're not duplicates. And that's great for us. Now, if you're dealing with databases where you're storing usernames and passwords or sensitive information, that's when this starts to break down a little bit. Because now, instead of us just having two random documents that we're trying to match up against each other, and the likelihood is one in 340 and decillion, what we end up with is people actually doing an intentional attempt to create a collision. So that means you're, instead of just comparing two random documents together or a bunch of random documents, they're actually running through uh, password tables or a bunch of hash tables and trying to match it up and find out if they can hit on those same hash values. And what, why are we talking about hash values and security? If I'm going to store files in a database, I have a bunch of records in my database, so I can have my usernames and my password fields. And it used to be this is how people would store data. So they store all their usernames here, all their passwords here. And when you put your username and password in on the login box, what would happen is it would say, oh, is the username equal to the one that they put in and the password equal to the one they put in? Great, let them into the website. Problem is, this database, if it gets compromised, means that somebody has a list of all your usernames and all your passwords in something called clear text. That means it's completely unencrypted and there's no way uh, that your password is ever going to be secure again because it's going to be dumped out to the internet and, and you got a problem. So the solution that people came up with at the first level was to say instead of storing the password, what I'll do is I'll take the MD5 hash, put that in the password field. So it's a little bit more secure because now when you type in the password on the website, it hashes it first, it checks the hash against the, the database password, and there's no way to regenerate your password back from the hash value. So even if they get the table of username and password hashes, you're not going to be able to log into that website with the hash because you can't translate it back into the original password. The problem is what people started to do was take the common passwords, hash them all out, store the hashes, and then use the hash, uh, the hash table that they previously generated to look up against uh, breached password database sites and say, okay, now we can see what the original password was and we can attempt to get into the site by kind of like generating this list. So when you're brute forcing um, and trying to create matches against MD5 hashes for the security side, you could very easily run a program that just checks millions and millions of different variations on password against different hash values trying to find a collision. Once you find that collision, then you have the ability to log into that site, even if the password doesn't match. It could be a different password that generates the same MD5 hash. Remember, there is a chance that two separate things could generate that same MD5 hash value. And if you spend a lot of computing power, you can actually do that. Now, in the research space, they wanted to see if they could take this concept and push it out to the documents being identical concept. And trying to figure out if you could actually create two separate documents intentionally that share the same MD5 or SHA-1 hash. And in particular, they were trying to do it with the SHA-1 algorithm. And there was a proof of concept put out showing that they could actually intentionally create two separate documents that end up with the same MD5 or SHA-1 hash when, uh, when actually run through the algorithm. The reason that we don't worry about that is it's very impractical. Um, they ended up having to put about 6,500 years worth of CPU cycles. If you were to translate all the CPU power they put at it into one computer running at this thing, it would take one computer about 6,500 years just to do the math, to calculate the hashes, to create a PDF document that matched another PDF document and generated the same MD5 hash. So what we're talking about here is a coincidence versus a targeted attack. And when we're dealing with data collections, people are not intentionally trying to obfuscate um, a hash value uh, by generating these collision type documents in their usual way of storing data, A, because it's very costly and would require a ton of computing power, and B, even if you were to, to create this thing intentionally, where you had two documents that, would, that were vastly different that contained the same MD5 hash, you don't know which one of those is going to end up being the primary document and which one is going to get deduped out. So the document you're trying to hide, if you were to take that approach, might end up being the primary document depending on the order that it was processed. So we treat MD5 hashes 
as a very solid way of actually validating that two documents are the same thing for the purposes of deduplication, because the likelihood of them not being the same document is so astronomical, literally astronomical, because we have, we're dealing with numbers um, that you would normally deal with in astronomy. But, um, but at that point, we're not worried about people intentionally trying to breach a database using the, the deficiencies in the algorithm. We're just trying to figure out how to very quickly deduplicate. And again, the more complex your hash algorithm, the larger your numbers are going to be, less likely to collision, but the longer it's going to take. So you're going you're to end up with a lot of CPU cycles. So I hope this wasn't too high level. If you guys have any questions, if you're really uh, confused by this, feel free to leave some comments down below or uh, reach out to us. Thanks. All right. Thank you, Donnie. I hope you guys found this interesting. If you have any questions for Donnie, be sure to put them in the comment section under the video and he'll answer those questions personally. Now, Donnie is not really good at doing outros, so I will remind you to follow V Discovery on social media networks listed on your screen. And if you want to see previous videos, check us out on YouTube. Thank you.